Hi, Anna. Hi, Lily. What day is the best for punk and rock music? I don't know, Lily, which day is the best for punk music? A green one, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and that was literally the best one I could find on punk music specifically. Sorry. Can I tell you one that I found? Oh, yeah, please. I was at a punk band in the 80s called Missing Cat. You might remember our flyers. <laughs> That's good. Okay, that one's that one's great. Okay. Well, <laughs> like the Green Day one way better, but still I was like No, the Green Day one is not better. That one's so much better. <laughs> oh my god. That oh that's really good. <laughs> okay, I'm can gonna I, leave. Can oh, I tell you another one? Oh yeah, please. What do you call a punk band full of dads? I don't know. What do you call a punk band full of dads? Pop punk. Aw. <laughs> I'm making a face where I'm like, aww. <laughs> oh. That is cute, right? That is a very cute one. Hi, I'm Anna. And I'm Lily. And this is Liliana's pre-read media tick. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. Perfect. Today we're going to talk about the television show We Are Lady Parts. Yes, this TV show came out in 2021 um, and is about an all-female Muslim punk band based in London. Um, and it was created, written, and directed by um, Nida Manzoor, um, and is partly based on her experiences. It started off as a comedy sketch for a pilot program that Channel 4 did in 2018, and all the original songs were written by Mansoor and her siblings. Yeah, which I just love that fact. Of, yeah! <laughs> you can tell as well, like, the kind of, like, yeah, just, like, the sort of, like, um, that sort of sibling experience, like, really comes through in the songs and in they're really good yeah. songs this is like the almost what's the word contemporary um, yeah yeah definitely sort of thing we're covering because we just both watched the show and loved the show so much mm. and yeah. we are very well aware as lily and i have talked about before that because neither one of us is muslim yeah so we like want to acknowledge like our positions as like two white non-muslims yeah. Um, but we do want to talk about this show because I think it's really great and that we don't think we've seen that many people talking about it. Like, we might just not be in the right spaces, but yeah, but we both think it's a really great show and we just wanted to talk about it. But yeah, we're aware of our position as, like, two non-white Muslims talking about this show. So, yeah. Yeah. I can only talk about Catholic guilt from a personal perspective. <laughs> <laughs> you do quite, quite a lot and it's, yeah, very entertaining. And I'm not even, like, a full-on Catholic. I'm a dirty little heathen. But no, in terms of the show, I feel like it got a little bit of attention. Mm. I saw it a lot discussed on TikTok and I saw it a lot mm. discussed on Twitter and stuff. Yeah. And now here we are to drum up yeah. a little bit more attention because I do need more people to talk about the show because I want another. Hopefully it'll get a second season as well because it's sort of, I feel like the end of it opened it up to like it would work very nicely. Like it, it works fine, like as its own like kind of thing. But I think it would work really well as like a two season show. At least it two really seasons. would because it, it's got like a lot. There's a lot further you could go with all the characters and with storylines. I think they did a, did a good job of kind of like wrapping it up, kind of like neatly and like you know, it sort of felt like a satisfying ending, definitely. But it was still kind of like leaving it open to the next season, which I really hope happens. I'm gonna pretend to be Arbed for a second and demand six seasons in a movie. <laughs> spoilers ahead but we do encourage all of you to watch this show it's just fun and it uh, uses so many different film language styles mm. so like just you're gonna have fun watching this i guarantee yeah. you just but definitely. Uh, spoilers ahead <laughs> <laughs> definitely the show opens with amina capricorn uh pursuing a phd sorry i just never hear someone say capricorn really i just it's always like leo or something i didn't even know anything about astrology <laughs> but i was like me too <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you're a Capricorn. Yeah. I talk to so many people about star signs, you know, I just, no, I don't. But yeah, I always wanted to be a Capricorn. I just feel like Sagittarius, which is what I am, is just like kind of a boring one. Capricorn's cool. It's like the goat. Um, she's pursuing a PhD. She's hoping to get married to a nice guy and is looking for him through marriage apps. When a very dreamy guy called Asan gives her a flyer about a punk band looking for a guitarist, she shows up to the audition to fi uh, find him and talk to him. There, the baby, uh, the baby, <laughs> lady and band became one word for some reason. 
<laughs> there the band Lady Part. It did take me three rewatches to realize that the band was not called We Are Lady Parts. I thought the band was the called. I them. thought the band was called We Are Lady Parts. <laughs> I'm guessing it's like because you know the film. Do you know I haven't seen it. Have you seen the film Spinal Tap or is it This Is Spinal Tap? <laughs> it's not what we're going to be talking about today. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but like no, I did on the third we watched she the, Amina's mom said oh that's such a great name lady parts and I was like oh I thought they were called we yeah. are lady parts <laughs> I'm guessing, I guess I remember talking to my parents about the name and no it's really interesting because it's like what kind of ba- like kind of bands that like relate to sort of like jet like sex pistols or something like that or like right. um uh vibrators or something like that or like you know like those kind of like punk names and it's sort of like lady parts where it's kind of like a sort of euphemized version but it could also be like you know they're like women who are like in punk and like they're like parts of the band I guess and sort of like it's sort of like kind of towing that line between like the kind of like explicit punk punk, punk which is like very much their like music but also kind of like sort of I don't know what, what do you think I just because talking to you just now I realized it's also like to do with acting right mm. <gasps> yes I was like, why did it, I never noticed that before? Like, also, like, lady parts are, like, specifically gendered, female gendered parts. The things that um, women, quote unquote, can audition for are mm. the, only the lady parts of movies. Also, what you said, it's really interesting in terms of it can be sort of read sexually, but it also isn't explicitly anything, really, because you're just... Yeah, also, yeah. like, what is a lady part? Yeah. It's kind of, like, cheeky, but sort of kind of very punk. But it's also, like you said, like, it's like, we are lady parts, like, lady parts is in, like, kind of meta, like, this is, like, aware of itself as a TV show and sort of, like, representation. (laughs) Wasn't there, like, a moment in Bob's Burgers, and this is incredibly cis-normative, someone said women's parts or something, and then Jean was like, what are the women's parts? And then uh, Tina says, the vagina and the heart. Aww. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, very cis-normative, but also, aww. (laughs) It's also so odd because like one, vaginas aren't restricted to women, but also men also have hearts. Yeah. <laughs> but men, men are heartless. Men <laughs> don't have hearts. But yeah. Just so romantic and so Tina. Sorry, we do have a Bob's Burgers episode as well. Yeah, if you haven't listened to our Bob's Burgers episode, that will probably be coming out before this one does. So I'm yeah. sure you can go listen to that. Yeah. One of the band members, uh, Saira, um, Saira, Saira, Saira. Um, one of the band members, Saira, remembers Amina from like having performed at the school thing before and remembers her as being really good. And then Amina waves them off since the pressure of performing live gives her nausea, nausea and diarrhea. Um, and <laughs> then the band tracks her down because they do want her in the band and they use Asan to lure her into the band. After he friend zones her, she starts to explore her creativity with the band more. And they are booked for an audition by their, I just said band manager, band manager, <laughs> mom Tuss. Amina seizes on the pressure and they do not get their spot. But after mom Tuss gives the band an online platform, which Saira is really against, an influencer reaches out to feature them in an article. And the drummer Aisha uh, falls for her, the influencer, called Serena. And Serena uses the band for a sensationalist piece that frames them as disrespectful towards their faith. And also like against the West, like the article was, yeah. and the band receives yeah. major Which backlash. Just they get like massive, yeah, massive backlash from like every corner. It's like, thanks, Serena. <laughs> Cheers for that one. Yeah. Also so heartbreaking for, for Aisha. <laughs> that was so no. shit. Um, Amina is, because of this article, outed to her friends who didn't know that she was in a punk band. And Saira breaks up the band out of anger and she yells at everybody and make, mm. like just creates a lot of conflict and tension. Uh, Mom Tuss realizes that the article also gave them more attention in general and that they gathered real fans online. After encouragement from her mother, she organizes a gig herself and invites Bisma, and, um, who's the drummer. Uh, sorry, Bisma, who's the... Um, Basis. The basis, thank you. And Aisha to the venue where they meet up with Saira, who apologizes for her hurtful words. And Saira hopes to get Amina back into the band, but Amina has decided to get back to finding a husband. Realizing, though, like through blind dates and stuff, that she will never not be judged for what she wants, she decides to rejoin the band and her parents enthusiastically drive her I to love the gig. Her parents. Yeah. <laughs> where she <laughs> joins so in. Sweet. 
Yeah, that's so lovely. And she joins in the middle of their rendition uh, of We Are the Champions before she promptly throws up. <laughs> Hooray! Yeah. Punk. And we did talk about We Are the Champions before because it's one of those overplayed songs and I do kind of love it uh, on my own and no. you don't. And after you really finish... That song. <laughs> but you have to... Because it's, not because it's not a great song, right? Because it's overplayed. Or do you just in general not like it? I, I think it's a bit of both. I just don't think it's like that good of a song to sing along to and it's not that <laughs> the lyrics aren't that exciting like it's it's just i don't know I'm just like eh. i think it's probably because it's overplayed but i just it's just yeah not my favorite song i really like listening to it on my own like not necessarily not like all the time i would like, choose to private. listen to it <sighs> i do i don't Sorry. mind it but like when it's played anywhere else i'm like oh god no because it's just there's just something so embarrassing about so much sincerity do you know what i mean mm. yeah no it's true and it's just like not that interesting as like a song it's just like the lyrics aren't that interesting in the mute like it's just sort of <laughs> like there are much better queen songs they just are ones that have been overplayed as well but are still quite good like somebody to love and you're like that's really exciting that song like i can listen to that and i'm like yeah amazing i guess it's hard to just, like sing in a stadium though yeah also a song that would uh, um, be really good for Armina would be Under Pressure. <gasps> yes, it was. an amazing song. That is an amazing oh. song. <laughs> the Jedwood version, even better. <laughs> my favourite version of that song. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh my God. That was my first introduction to that song, I think. I mean, probably not. I probably need to hear it in like a different capacity. That's the first version I remember. Oh, Jedwood. What a time. X Factor. <laughs> huh. My youth. I'm sorry, I'm drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but look, yeah, at the end of that episode, like when I finished, I was like, Anna, I finished it. And you were like, Do you like we are the champions now? And I was like, <laughs> No. <laughs> Still I just, no. But I just think for those kind of moments, that song is perfect because it's just like this embracing of like your own, I don't know, skills and capabilities and just like, yeah. Yeah, it is kind of so well. Yeah, it's like kind of reclaiming of that song from just like white footballism yeah mm -hmm. we are the champions <laughs> sorry yeah I don't like that song but yes it, it, I, it, it fit the moment I enjoyed it in the moment it, it did a good job I did a good job with it <laughs> I'll allow it okay I think we're going to move into the pre-read text section now um a pre-read text is a concept um, that was created by the YouTuber Rowan Ellis that sort of refers to um, when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or a piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it's about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. Um, so like uh, cultural consciousness of the story characters, images and concepts are built up, which might have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material and instead all come from, come from adaptations that have come after um, that kind of original source material has been released. It doesn't, I feel like this definition doesn't like directly relate to We Are Lady Parts, um, like as, because it's not like, you know, something that's been around for a long time. In this episode, we're going to kind of stretch that definition um, to talk just more generally about like audience preconceptions, because I think there's a lot to unpack in this show. Yeah. Um, and I think, and I think also the show is very aware of this, like obviously, it's like aware that like audiences will have preconceptions and assumptions about like Muslim women um, and like punk as a genre. Um, and it's sort of, it's, yeah, kind of very meta aware of that. Like the show is about that whilst also being a show that people are reacting to. Like, I know that um, the comedy, like the first like, comedy pilot that they released, like it's the only one of that series that um, the comments disabled on YouTube. I'm guessing oh, really? they got a ton of, yeah, because they got a ton oh, of backlash. Oh, like, fuck racist sake. abuse. Yeah. Um, however, <laughs> But I think it's also a comedy show, so it's sort of like dealing with, it's like aware of these very heavy things, but also being like, and yet we're going to like give these women like just the space to be and to like be kind of happy and to have like a, com like this is this is a lighthearted comedy show, like as much as it's about anything else. Um, in terms of like preconceptions, I kind of goes without saying, yeah, stereotypes around Muslim women as oppressed and needing to be saved by like, um, uh, white people basically um, Muslim women is exotic or not British or like kind of like foreign and not like kind of like fitting in enough um, and also kind of like one dimensional as well um, like the actress who plays Amina um, Anyana Vassan said um, in like a Guardian interview that sometimes you get character breakdowns on a script and the description will literally just be Muslim as if that explains how you're supposed to play the character 
but here was a script that didn't do that and not just with one character but with so many um so we wanted to kind of like quickly run through the characters I think introduce you to the band also in case you sort of think that you've seen her face before um she played an anti-abortion activist in sex education yeah I'd forgotten that as well until you said I was like oh yeah it's her yeah and she was really funny in that as well I really like the way they're like introduced in the show it's like Aisha <laughs> drums uber driver she's got like um her car's called like what's her car called Hans Hans oh yeah how dare Hans. you <laughs> I'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> oh she's so good and she was in the original um comedy short as well yeah um one of and the apparently ones. yeah and apparently she like the before i can't remember what she did before that but she like this was like her first like major role or anything um and she just like pretended to be able to play drums at the audition um <laughs> i couldn't <laughs> um but it's like very punk like i think all of them none of them could actually like play um instruments like before taking yeah. on the role so they just like learned on the job which is a very punk thing to do yeah um, I also yeah. love the fact that the way the camera framed her when she was sitting on the hood of the car because it was sort of mm -hmm. like those like MTV Crips videos where someone is just showing off their dope car and it was like this is my car and it's just not that impressive of a car and then it's like it's called Hans. <laughs> <Tons>. <laughs> Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I love her. I love her relationship, the way that she was friends also with her brother. Yeah, like, SM. because like in the beginning, she was like, no, 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 you have to friend zone her because even massive dweebs have rights, man. <laughs> but she was like, no, 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 this needs to be very clear from the beginning that you're not into her so she doesn't get hurt. Yeah. And I just, oh, I love her so much. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and her eyeliner. Yeah, her eyeliner is fantastic. Um, and then we have Amina, lead guitar. Uh, Capricorn finishing a degree in microbiology <laughs> yeah oh she's oh she's just great yeah she's the main character and she does like the voiceover for the show as well she has two very supportive parents who got her started I think in her love of music her father is also really into Don McLean they kept saying Don McLean and I kept thinking like because I have no idea who that is and I was is it Don McLean Don McLean <laughs> yeah it's embarrassing that I'm also like I, as like you know English is my first language I was like yeah Don McLean and I'm like no of course it's Don McLean like I've heard of Don McLean but I was like oh that, yeah that's how you spell it obviously oh god yeah uh, then we have oh, we need Mar American Pie oh, oh okay I do know that song <laughs> Just finding this out now <laughs> quick cut this from the episode this is embarrassing <laughs> I really um, like American Pie anyway sorry I know that there's like some joke about that song being bad or people don't like it or something. Maybe because it's just like kind of, I don't know, self-indulgent maybe. But I just really, I used, to, I used to listen to that song on repeat. Like when I first got my first iPod, I'd just like, just listen to that song on my little iPod shuffle. The first time I ever heard that song was because I used to, in order to learn English, I used to watch Friends quite a lot. And there was an episode where Phoebe dates a diplomat from a foreign country. And sort of the joke is that she cannot communicate with him because he doesn't speak English. Uh, okay. They used to make this joke a lot. I mean, I guess they still do. But he was from an unspecified Eastern European country. Yeah. Mm. He wasn't from a specific country. Yeah. It's really tiny and no one knows what it's called. You know what I mean? It's the kind of joke where yeah. they're like, no, no, no. The it. joke is that Americans don't know anything. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. not quite. But he sings American Pie. That's how they sort of end up bonding. In the outro Aww. of that episode, they play American Pie on the guitar. <laughs> Music, bringing people together <laughs> since yeah. Anna watched that episode of Friends. <laughs> um, yeah, Amina, like, um, really wants to get married um, and is sort of, like, very obsessed with, like, finding the man of her dreams. Um, and it's, like, told through a rom-com framing. Again, we'll talk more about this yeah. um, a bit later. And you've also written down as a little side note, do the sock puppets mean anything? <laughs> I just didn't notice them the first couple of times and then I was like, oh, what is this referencing? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I do love this show, but the sock puppets, a moment where I questioned like <laughs> what's going on. It's a bit like, is this not, do, does this mean anything? Why are the sock puppets? I mean, I'm sure it does mean something because why else would you do that? Like that takes work. You know what I mean? <laughs> to like add that yeah. in. I wonder if it's like it might be a Spinal Tap reference that we're not getting because we haven't seen Spinal Tap. Oh. <laughs> you reckon? Maybe it's no a reference idea. to something. Maybe it's just a bit random and it's just like her like fan slightly whimsical fantasy. She's like playing the guitar in her like 
wardrobe. So what got me into the show was a clip I saw on TikTok, which featured Mom Tass, who's the next uh, band member we're going to talk about. She's the band manager. She Doesn't she work at a lingerie shop? Yeah, I think she works at a lingerie shop. I, I tried to write lingerie in the notes, and I just it was just like, how the fuck? I was like, I've spelt this word before, and I was just like, L A U N. No, that's not right. L U A N. And I was like, why can't I spell lingerie? Maybe you were thinking about like laundry, that it's sort of yes. got the same like, yeah, first it's part a, or something. That makes sense a, though. Yeah, I should have been able to like. I do know how to spell this word. I just I was on the bus trying to like type it, and I was just like, my brain is not working today. So she's the band manager. She works at a lingerie shop. She is the one that wants to reach out, and she has daydreams about the same way that Amina has daydreams about getting married and finding the love of her life. Mom mm -hmm. Tass has this daydream about running this almost like a record label, like a mm -hmm. management company or something. Just her being full on girl boss, just sitting behind the desk and being in charge of all these bands. Um, and then we have. Biz who is the bassist of the band. Um, she's the cartoonist of the killing period, which is a great looking comic that I really want to read. They were also disgusted by it and I was like, I want to read that actually. Yeah. Who are, like, who are these teenagers? I really want, I don't know whether it exists. I'm going to look it up actually. I love the scene where she just yells in a fully crowded space, sisters don't hate your bodies, your blood is your friend. <laughs> Your blood is your friend. Amina describes her as earth mother and actual mother because she does have a daughter. She's also the only one of them that actually married. Yes, yes. And then we have Saira, who is the lead vocalist and she also plays guitar. She works at a halal butcher shop. She's very fleshed out. Mm, yeah, yeah, she's a lot going on. She has a very difficult relationship with her parents because of all the aftermath of the death of her sister. Bandage her baby and family. And she's the one that recognizes Amina and also Amina's talent. And she's the one in the beginning on rewatch, I only noticed that Saira is actually the one that's pushing for Amina to stay in the band. Mm. Um, and also in the very first episode, we see her saying like, we don't seek fame, we simply seek to speak our truth before we are mangled by other people's bullshit ideas of us. And our music is about representation, it's about being heard. Mm. Yeah, and like I was like mentioned before, it's sort of that kind of quite meta idea of like, because like, the I mean like punk is about like self-expression. Again, we'll talk more about this in a bit. In this, like this show is also about like just allowing kind of these like Muslim women in a punk band to just sort of exist um it's also kind of like a light-hearted show rather than just like a really you know it could be like a really heavy show i guess no it could be the the backing of a really serious movie like a lot of oscar bait type stuff and like this is so oppressive this is so yeah. sad and this is so hard and that's not really what the show is in tone at all no you get like the kind of I was like, I've actually seen part of Wayne's World. And when they were doing like the 500 miles thing in the car, I was yeah. like, it's a reference to Wayne's World, probably. I'm like, <laughs> I get that one. Yeah. yeah. And then when they just go and like scream in a field and it's like, these women are just like allowed to do like fun things. Like they're not made, you know, it's like not just like, oh, you've got to like deal with like, you know, oppression all the time and sort of think about like your identity. It's like, and they're just allowed to like, you know, go and see, you know, they like, They've written the show where like these women are just like singing along in a car to like heavy metal music into the proclaimers and like can go scream in a field and like <laughs> can just sort of live their lives and have fun. At some point they said, oh, we make music together, we pray together. Like, all these things are sort of shown as very uplifting and like mm. that's where they find their empowerment is amongst each other and in their creativity. So it wasn't sort of shaped around, I don't know, sadness. And so the freedom that punk and rock music does allow you. <laughs> Okay, so um, we also wanted to talk about like punk and rock music. In this show, like punk is about like self-expression and this show is about self-expression. So it sort of makes sense that they've used punk as like the genre and like kind of staking your right to be there and like kind of telling your own truth. Like that um, Sarah quote that Anna told us earlier. It's a very loud genre of music. It's very much claiming your own space. Like We Are Lady Part sort of like feels like a kind of a callback to Riot Girl, like the Riot Girl movement and sort of like a kind of response to that. Because there is like a, a lot of criticism of the Riot Girl movement, which, I, wait, should I just explain, I'll explain what the Riot Girl movement was, or like yeah. movement in quotation marks. So it was basically like a feminist punk movement in quotation marks in like the 1990s that was sort of like mainly based in Washington, but also kind of like was around the US and also kind of around the world, I think kind of mainly. It was sort of quite fragmented um like there were a couple there was one like main group that was sort of like this is riot girl um who were like based in washington um but it was sort of like quite a widespread community and they like um uh spoke to each other through like um zines and through like kind of like community like gatherings and stuff um and it was like a response to like the patriarchy of the time and kind of like challenging and reclaiming ideas of girlhood um was like very linked to like third wave feminism 
um, and like a few of like the bands are like related to Riot. Also, it was like kind of like a punk movement. It was like very DIY culture, um, kind of like you had zines as well. Um, and also like punk bands like Bratmobile, Bikini Kill. Uh, if you know the song Rebel Girl, that was like um, a Riot Girl song from the time. And it wasn't like entire like the way it's represented, it's like shown as like a very like white dominated movement, but there were also kind of like black and women of color also doing punk at the time that just aren't really shown. Um, and it was sort of also like, yeah, kind of, it's interesting because like whiteness was like centered in Riot Girl, um, in the Riot Girl movement, but also like you kind of have like the whitewashing of punk and rock as well, just in general and in that movement when it wasn't like entirely white and when like, I think allegedly like punk started off, it wasn't just like kind of like, you know, like the idea of like the punk band that's like the white men, like the four piece white men or whatever, but that like is kind of like a, a consequence of like the mainstream, like partly like the mainstreaming of it and also partly because like kind of whiteness centers itself in like any space as well, I guess as well. Yeah. And even if you are aware, it's this thing of what uh, filters down to the mainstream that people even become aware of it. Mm. Because growing up, I heard a lot about grunge mm. music, but I never, ever heard about female rock bands ever. I was not aware of Riot Girl as a movement until mm. I was in my 20s. And that's so screwed up. Mm. It just always yeah. filtered down to like a very sort of mainstream idea of what this is supposed to look like, especially <laughs> with rock music. Yeah, definitely. And even like, yeah, the Riot Girl movement sort of like made a decision not to talk to the mainstream press after like they engaged with it one time and it sort of like reduced their image to just sort of like a kind of aestheticized like skinny white girl looking kind of pretty and edgy um and sort of like reduced their like what they were looking for and their like um political objectives and that's something this show also kind of engages with is like um the idea of self-representation and sort of like how that representation can like go out of your control as well yeah, especially if you're part of a um, identity that just already has so many preconceptions and tropes within media, mm. whether it's like a fictional me media or just news media in general, in order mm. to sort of make money in a media space, how do you frame these people in order to make money and get clicks and everything? Yeah, and I guess because like punk is so um, like like the purpose of punk is like self-representation and so like uh, and not engaging like having like an underground scene where it's like self-representation um and is like a tool for negotiating rejecting preconceptions and assumptions which this show is kind of all about and that's kind of like like makes use of punk in that way um so like you might expect like kind of one dimensional idea of like muslim women as these as like subordinate or expect like a white punk band um, and instead you get lady parts. And it's still an issue. You still, if you think about punk bands, you still have this very specific idea of what that looks like. And it is mm. just always male and always white. And yeah, sorry. I was just thinking about the movie. Is the movie called Moxie? It was, um, oh um, yeah, I haven't seen that. Uh, it was directed by Amy Poehler. I'm getting mm. this wrong. I'm so sorry. Yes. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And they featured a band that's in their like punk rock band called the Linda Lindas. And they like also covered this and they wrote songs in like the last couple of years. Racist, stupid boy. And I remember racist, stupid boy. Yeah. yeah. Or sexist, race, racist, sexist boy or sexist, racist boy. And talking about this, how do you talk about your own experience and stuff? And mm. sort of having this be specifically rock music because it's just considered a quote unquote, not feminine way of singing but like this idea of not giving a shit being against what is expected of you yes allowing absolutely. this anger to be expressed through the creative lens i remember like a john jett and like this idea that just a lot of the places that these um, groups performed in the 90s when they showed up they just a lot of people just walked out because they were like i don't want to hear a woman sing like that mm. and sort of this Ooh. Yeah, hoping and expecting that the audience is there for you to also engage with your content, you know? Sorry, not yeah. content. That sounds so content. diminishing. <laughs> uh, with your just creativity and your work, you know? Mm. Oh, yeah, so I think like an example of like this in the show as well is like Montaz and like yeah. how, you know, she tries to like, I mean, they like Lady Parts try and like book gigs, like they go to that, you know, the one where they do the audition the first time and it's like that guy with a pint in a pub. And it's just yeah. like, I mean, it's really uncomfortable in that space. And like, they just get like kicked out because he's just a git. Um, yeah. And then they try, then um, Zarina like does make, Zarina sets up that gig for them in the like Bracey pub, um, which goes well, but like we later learn is sort of just like her sort of setting up that narrative of like, kind of like 
culture clash it's sort of like using them as like a pawn in like culture wars sort of representation yeah um and and then like Montaz kind of goes around and tries to find like different gigs and then like uh, like it's just us asked like you know oh are you being like is like some guy making you wear like a kneecap um can't, do you need us to call someone and it's sort of like they can't find any space that will just like allow them to be so they just go and make that space themselves and like set up their own concert instead it's also one of two scenes when when Aisha is driving the car the three guys in the back are also like, is your dad making you do that? When both Momtaz and Aisha lean into that stereotype, because mm -hmm. Momtaz then sort of responds with, yes, I have to wear the, I have to wear this, like, please give me a kick. And like, yeah, it's Aisha, like, yeah. If I, and I, give, I don't know what will happen. And they're like, you think <laughs> yeah. But like, it's the same reaction they also get Aisha when she sort of says, yeah, if I don't do this, then my dad is going to marry me off to a guy from Iraq or something. And then they're also like, are you taking the piss? She didn't start this conversation <laughs> with the stereotype. You brought that in. She was he was the one who made this like silly comment, like yeah. Momtas came here for a gig. Aisha's just here to do like a certain specific job. Like why? Like she's not the one making this. She's not the one making this uncomfortable. You are. Yeah. So there's just this framing of if both of these women like you lean into what they're sort of being called in the first place, then the white people in that scene are also reacting in a way. How dare you criticize my my Islamophobia? My... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also that mom task for what she wants to do just also cannot exist in her own space. Community elders also don't want to give her a gig. She oh, just yeah. she just has yeah. to make her own space. Yeah. yeah. Also love the fact that that comes from my mother. You can do this on your own. Why do you keep asking? Yeah. Organize something yourself. Yeah. I did want to talk a little bit about the idea of selling out because that was a huge thing when I was a yeah. very small child. I had no idea what anybody was talking about. Um, <laughs> in the 90s, honking grunge bands were, um, there was this idea of you're not supposed to sell out the integrity of your music because there's always this argument of if you sell out at a certain point, you just have nothing which now seems so strange because it's just such a huge part of social media to sell yourself, present yourself as a commodity at all times. But this used to be an actual mainstream conversation. Yeah, it's weird. I remember it went away that like, I remember seeing the critique of it, like, you know, we live under capitalism though and people do need to make money, which is like a fair critique as well. I mean, it, it's sort of like, I don't know, if you, if you watch the musical Rent and then you're like, hmm, it's, it, it's that kind of like, you're just as kind of being a struggling artist for the sake of it. It's sort of like more of a kind of like an idealized version of what kind of like the struggling artist life is like, rather than being kind of like, yeah, it's kind of shit to not be able to afford food, you know? It's also kind of like very nice if like, you know, it's that kind of like aestheticizing that and sort of like, kind of, yeah, making that into like romanticizing it without kind of looking at the realities of not being able to like live somewhere or like eat, like feed yourself and it's sort of kind of I think the pushback there was like a good amount of pushback against the idea that like you ha like if you sell out then you're awful and, and instead being like no actually like this idea of like being the starving artist is kind of problematic guys <laughs> let's yeah. rethink this who are these starving artists who can actually afford to be a starving artist you know because mm. starving is an yeah. actual like cause of death there's a very big difference between putting most of the money that you make into your art but mm. there is a very big difference between that and just literally not being able to afford a roof over your head. Mm. Looking at that person being like, well, at least you're not a sellout. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of money to be authentic in a way. Like it takes mm. a lot of cash from daddy to <laughs> to be able to afford this sort of like idealized version of that. Yeah. To make your art for art's sake rather than make art for money. Who, yeah. It's literally like who can afford to do that? Because in reality, it's genu generally like, oh, I end up like getting like some financial help from like my family or whatever to make my own. You were living in like a really expensive flat somewhere in like, a fabulous space in like a good neighborhood, mm. quote unquote, a good neighborhood and making your art never selling out and only allowing sort of certain spaces to carry your work. That is a very privileged thing to be able to do. Mm. So I just remember there was a lot of talk about that, but also just among fans, you know, as soon as certain bands started playing big festivals and stuff, people were like, oh, you're, they sold out and now their music is shit. Yeah. That was also your part of it there is no ethical consumption in a capitalist in capitalism i'm like that means you're supposed to be able to feed yourself that doesn't necessarily mean that that doesn't mm. mean that everything you do for money is always yes girl like yeah. queen whatever like <laughs> it doesn't give like a free pass and everything like there is degree and there is like contact no everything's black and white nothing's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's just usually sort of the argument it is something that plays out in this um show quite a lot because 
um, when Momtas sets up the online presence, um, Saira's really against it because she says the internet is for truth and authenticity go to die. <laughs> she has a um, point because yeah. that's literally what happens to them. Um, yeah. While we were talking, you know, this is a very different kind of version of selling out where it's like that um, level of control over representation goes away and like her prophecy of like, we're trying to tell, speak our truth before it gets like mangled, it, like it becomes mangled once they kind of hit the mainstream um, and they're sort of forced into this role of like, um, yeah, like culture war, kind of hated by both sides and sort of like Anna made the really great point about um, the kind of media framing that like um, Lady Parts get kind of forced into like by Zarina's article um, is creating like a conflict where there isn't one so that like a religion and punk do not oppose opposites to the band and it's like, you know, they, they go together like they merge together for them and that's just like both parts of their identity that sort of like are interconnected like Anna said before, it's like we play together, we pray together. These two things aren't um, in con in conflict, um, but that that conflict is created by like the media lens and by like I guess like a kind of wider white lens um, on onto their lives that then they lose control of when their music hits the internet and like and is portrayed in that way. Yeah, trying to put them together with that what you call like a Brexit pop. This mm. idea of she did book that for them in order to create this idea that she was, I'm assuming, hoping that there would be some sort of bigger conflict was going to happen at that gig and it just didn't. Mm. What the fuck yeah, is wrong is... with you? Like could have ended in actual like physical violence. Yeah. Like, and it's like this show is like, you know, it's still a comedy show and it keeps yeah. things relatively light most of the time. But it's like, yeah, that could have been like quite dangerous, like a very dangerous space for them to be in. Like they're kind of surrounded by like all these kind of like white Brexiteer men playing their music. It's very much a sort of like you're kind of creating this situation to see what happens. And yep. yeah, it could have gone very badly wrong. Like that's not a safe space for them to be in. Yeah. So what happens is that oh, Serena reaches out to them over their internet online presence. And then Serena meets with up with them and starts talking to them individually for a piece she's going to write about them. And she asks them about their family dynamics and like the way that they dress and everything. And she mm -hmm. talks to Momtas about wearing the niqab, for example, and she says it makes quite a statement. And then Momtas talks about listen, this makes me feel closer to God and it gives me confidence like Beyonce. And she talks to Amina and accuses her of being ashamed because Amina hasn't pop, hasn't put the fact that she's in a band anywhere in her social media, which the reason she didn't do that is because Amina doesn't really quite know how to tell her best friend Nora about it yet and doesn't mm -hmm. know what, how her friend will feel about this, or it doesn't think that her friend is going to react positively. She accuses Bisma of upholding her family values because she doesn't have a day job. This is some, this is a person with a child amazing yeah and she starts hanging out and dating Aisha and when the article comes out she also talks to Syrah Syrah's manifest manifesto and how Syrah is so all about talking against oppression and sin mm -hmm. uh, simplifies it's being a about Syrah being oppressed by the Muslim community when she's talking about no 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 this is about against capitalism and against ca and against the polit political system and yeah, it's like way more complex. Like, it's like all of their characters are way more complicated. Like Syrah's like politics are way more complicated. But yeah, um, like Zarina's article like um basically just turns all of them into stereotypes that are like kind of very easily easy, you know, very sensational stereotypes um that are like gonna create a lot of clickbait um and a lot of anger and sort of like do the whole like yeah kind of like Twitter storm of aggression. And trolling. Also in terms of conflict with your parents, I thought it was very interesting because one who doesn't have conflicts with their parents, who doesn't have conflicts with parents' uh, expectations of you, who mm. doesn't sort of struggle with parents, whatever religion or even if it's not religion, kind of upbringing your parents had, that's still like, is always going to be part of whatever conflict you're going to have with them. Her mother lost a child mm. and Syrah lost a sister. That's going to create conflict in any scenario. So simplify that kind of stuff is you know what i mean like a manifesto that came out of that part like not that that's her main strive in life or whatever the fact that this has to have had a huge influence on Saira and the fact that she's took to this kind of music express her anger at the world in a way and the system and everything just just simplistically put that in like oh you're being oppressed by the muslim community it's just so disrespectful to her as a person and her struggles. Mm. It completely dehumanizes all of them because it just puts them into specific just lady parts, <laughs> Muslim lady parts. Yes. From media. They're put into parts, literally they're put into like, out, out of their like, their own like representation or the parts they choose themselves and are put into like, the parts that society wants them to play. 
because they understand that and that's like the lens that like they've always been viewed through or like the mainstream media views them through um yeah yeah so the article is called haramd and dangerous and she also says something like bad guitar skills or something or like subpar guitar skills yeah she insults them like as musicians she also uses all of their statements about family structure and all that bismite one point just says fuck that and then she says she said fuck uh, to traditional family values mm. not the same thing you wrote this simplifies them into a specific angle like them being against the west and islam and i think the show for the most part pretty much most of this focuses on people of the community sort of reacting to them, which I thought was interesting mm. because I remember watching this and thinking like, this can be like, really physically dangerous for Muslim women to be framed that way in a media article because it does go viral. But I think they do like, yeah, I think you're right. They kind of, this show isn't about, like this show is about like kind of Muslim communities and like these women's, actually, these women's lives in their communities rather than like and try and seeing how like the kind of like white mainstream gaze like affects those communities, but then also not being like, we're going to center this white gaze. And it's all about like, it decenters that reaction, that kind of outside or like the kind of like white mainstream reaction. Like that's not what this show is about. It kind of, and it, instead it centers their communities. When they get framed in like haramed and dangerous, the show is called, we are lady parts. This thing of reclaiming, we are, and we are not going to be denied the female aspect of this, Yes, but also not like, our faith or our understanding of music and our skill set. Yeah. It's a base self-representation. It's, we are, it's claiming, yeah. like laying claim to identity. Yeah. Anyway, fuck Serena. <laughs> <laughs> Serena in her article that made me so angry because especially when they have that scene where they sit together she says like I didn't mention your sexuality you asked me not to and I didn't I'm like do you want a fucking medal that you didn't out somebody <laughs> oh crap yeah. you a low bar <laughs> I also think it's interesting when Cyrus, because Cyrus, the one that's again, completely against doing this article in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so when mom Tess talks to her, she says, this is the most read whatever magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Cyrus says most read or most clicked mm -hmm. because we do freak out about headlines without reading the article that yeah. happens a lot online. And mm -hmm. how many people actually engage with the actual band and music before they yelled at them online of being disrespectful to to the community. And, and like we said, it's like, it's that sensationalist, like kind of creating something that will get a lot of clicks and not necessarily something that people think a lot about. It's sort of, yeah, like knowing like what will kind of press people's buttons and get people enraged so that they'll like kind of engage with this media, but like not in like a deep way or not in a way that sort of like centers the humanity of the people that it's about, just like kind of playing into these like um, narratives that uh, they know will make money. And that sort of goes back to what we said about uh, selling out. Cyrus' reaction to this is just anger and like, fuck everybody uh, mm. kind of attitude. And Amina's reactions to this is, you know, she does care what people think because she is, she says, I'm a member of the society, I actually live on this planet. She doesn't want to negate everything in her life just because she's been framed in a certain way online. And she's like, everybody hates us. Everybody hates us. It is someone from their own community that sells them out. And I thought that's interesting because like in sort of this white racist patriarchal media landscape that we all live in, mm. because she says, I know what I'm doing. Serena does yeah. has that. Well, yeah, she knows how to play the system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And she knows how to get herself like powerful position in within that media landscape, as long as she uses other people's stories and to turn them into clickbait, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, she just exactly what she's I think I mean I can't quite remember what she says now but she kind of does exactly what she says she'll do but it's just like and it's like this is yeah if you want to go mainstream this is what the mainstream will make of you perhaps or like yeah but it is know, really fuck it just misrepresents what they actually care about mm -hmm. and it's kind of fucked up that it also just sort of works because it does mm -hmm. get them the attention that they needed in order to create a fan base yeah yeah but it is in a way though it's nice that some people were able to just like read between the lines and not just like take the clickbaity article like at face value and instead be like no i'm going to read into this what like kind of i'm going to see it and i'm going to see what's there and I'm going to like see part of myself in this and like kind of actually understand where these people are coming from because like I get like this is me and this is like the representation that I seek I see in them and then kind of creating that little community out of themselves which is just very nice. It's also interesting in terms of record deals there's always this argument whenever a group of people that isn't part of this white mainstream wants mm. to do something that is considered white mainstream like rock music but they're like well no one from that community is going to listen to that in the first place and they're like you don't know that no that is your yeah. perception of yeah. target audience mm. no group of people is ever a monolith there's all sorts of people yeah. who like all sorts of music like people listen to everything and 
nothing like you never just yeah. make a judgment like that based on anything so you don't know yeah. what people are gonna like and also if pop rock music is about sort of expressing anger muslim women have shit to say i'm assuming about yeah. that <laughs> and i think it's that kind of like idea of marketability and it's like marketability isn't the thing for them because like we see what happens with like the article and like it's like if you want to be marketable to like the white mainstream then this is what you're going to have to become and instead which is what I think the show is about as well. Like we were saying, it doesn't sort of like focus on the reaction. It focuses on these women and their like communities. And it's like, this music isn't for everyone. And that's not the point because if you were trying to make it for everyone, you'd have to like sort of live in these certain ways. And it's not about sort of centering. It's about like, you know, centering your own community and the community you want to create. And that's what they end up doing in the end. It's like, we're not going to like go to these places and try and like fit in by these standards. We're not going to try and like represent ourselves to these people because they won't get it. It's like, we're going to talk to, uh, talk about ourselves and represent ourselves to ourselves. And that's what they managed to create is their little community. And they have that gig at the end. It's very much the found family trope mm. because these are very different characters within the band. <laughs> I think you said this to me, like you're, the scene that you fell in love with was the most, one of the most yes, wrong commie yeah. of the... <laughs> the first date between Essa and show. Amina. Yeah, it's just, it was just like gold. It was just so funny. Like I remember watching it, like I was slightly hungover and I was like, I'm going to watch the show. And just like being like, yes, this is so good. This, this the awkwardness is just like superb. It's on point. It's fantastic. You have also the basics of a rom-com because you have this person who wants to fall in love. Her parents are sort of embarrassing to her anyway. I love her parents. Um, she has like best friend who seems a whole lot. I feel like they did sort of subvert this a little bit. Like in rom-coms, the main character usually has a best friend who has nothing better to do than help mm. you fall in love or Ooh, find a dude yeah. or something. I'm kind of happy that Nora had her own stuff going on and is clearly also a student and also just got engaged and is getting married and she's so looking forward to that and that is what she always wanted. I'm so glad that they didn't make Nora into just this person who has nothing. I mean, it also wouldn't make sense, I guess, in the narrative because then Nora would have figured out quicker what Amina yeah. is doing. But, um, but I just like the fact that she wasn't this weird, like best friend who's like, you need a, you really need to start dating more. So, you know, those characters in rom-coms, like the best yeah. friend and I'm always like, get a life <laughs> yeah so you have a lot of excuses of movie language from rom-coms she gets shot by an arrow and falls over yeah it was that sort of weird stuff where it's sort of like i also really like the sound effects like when there's like <laughs> the awkward boob touch and it's just like, like burp, and like, <laughs> just made it so much better it's like yes i love the, and the like when she like kind of runs out of a room like amina runs out of a room it's like Pshum! and <laughs> Yeah, I, I love the little sound effects. That was that was delightful. That was really um, nice. But yeah, but yeah, but then you get the slightly random like the sock puppets and the arrow, and it's like, okay, <laughs> I guess this is how this show is working. I love the arrow. <laughs> I also love when Mom Toss gets introduced as also voiceover by Amina, and they're like, there's rumors she was married to like a Saudi prince, and then you just see her in the lingerie shop, and she's pretending that the the underwear <laughs> is like an arrow, and then you also get the sound effect. Dong. <laughs> yeah, it was so good. <laughs> I just loved it so much. I think her just smoking the entire time is sort of what sold me on the show. In case Channel 4 is listening, second series, please. <laughs> um, again, a lot of rom-com stuff. You have a lot of awkward dialogue. She sort of says, I do to marriage when she says like, oh yeah, yeah, you should order that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he says like, I don't know, like, oh, I can't remember what he says now, but she's like married, like in like the kind of um, voice service, she's like, marry me. And then he's like oh you're into order and she's like i do or like yeah. you should oh no you should yeah you should yeah she's so good the fact that that actress just hasn't gotten to do more rom-com stuff this is she's so good at this yeah she's very good comedic timing getting back to rom-com tropes like she's obsessively checking her phone whether he's called yet she has um when serena when they first meet serena in the shop aisha has a moment where like, serena's hair is blown back she's sort of lit like an angel <laughs> Uh, Mina has this daydream where she sees herself in, in a black and white 50s film with Asan and this talk with this mid-Atlantic ac accent <laughs> and over dramatic. Oh, it's so good. Couldn't possibly. Yeah, it's, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's just so beautifully shot. Um, you also have thriller and horror a little bit when the band finds Amina in the lab, round is shaking. Oh yeah, and like the radio is going weird yeah. and then like the door just like is like slammed through, it like just breaks off its hinges. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is strange the show because it does kind of go into those sort of like slightly kind of wacky, whimsical, like non-naturalistic moments. Like when she gets shot by the arrow when the door comes off the hinges, <laughs> where it's sort of like, that didn't happen though, yeah. but like yeah it's sort of like kind of hyper realistic like doesn't quite yeah I, d I don't know what that's called when sort of stuff that isn't real happens or like and that's like non-diegetic or diegetic I was gonna whatever, say we like, talked about like this before over the top <laughs> we talked about but is it is that the, okay oh yeah that's the same for like stuff that isn't sound I don't think it's just reduced to sound I think it's also about mm. it's about what happens within the world of the show within the minds of the mm. characters or just for the audience yeah 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 mm. <clears throat> if you're a character mm. listen to us talk about diegetic or non-diegetic check out Bob's Burgers episode yeah we talk quite yeah we talk about it quite a lot yeah uh, it's a good time yeah but I just love those four girls just slamming down the door yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also love the heist trope them like walking alongside each other and you just see them next to each other which you don't just walk around like you're in a heist movie all the time <laughs> i definitely <laughs> I thought everyone did that i definitely have the voice over in my head <laughs> sorry i just have such a hatred for people who walk next to each other when there just isn't enough space on the sidewalk oh yeah no, that's very <laughs> i annoying. love the scene and i love the, the highest trope in the movie i do love the tropey thing of her putting away the guitar it just reminded mm. me of something from the Middle Ages, or Lord of the Rings. She's just putting away this mm. legendary sword or something, and then she, for the last time, touches the guitar strings, and it makes that sound. This is done now. Like my quest is done now. I'm not the <laughs> hero that you needed, or something. Also, of course, gets into the third act <laughs> because she is. Yeah. Also, when they meet up with Syrah, which I only noticed on the third watch, was you have this mm. Western score. And sort mm. of, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I remember that. And mom tells says we had to meet on neutral territory. Yes, thank you. Common ground. Like no, neutral. neutral. Yeah. Neutral sort of thing. Thank neutral. you. So when Essa and Amina go to, um, like, Noor's wedding reception, not wedding reception, the engagement party, like, and um, Essa, like, agrees to go with um, Amina, she, when they're on the bus, she's like, I'm pretty sure I've seen a rom com with this exact scenario. Like, they're kind of very much like playing on like. And then references the wedding, uh, the wedding date. <laughs> like, and I, because uh... I thought she was just going to say, oh, this is referencing the wedding date. And then she explains to him that that's about like, a hired sex worker. <laughs> Um, it's about like, an escort, uh, like a guy you could sort of hire for weddings or funerals or things like that. So mm -hmm. you can lie to your family and be like, no, 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 I'm with somebody. Fake dating trope, very, very popular among, especially mm. in romance novels, I feel like. Yeah, and I feel like if they have a second season, they're probably, do you reckon they'll get, I mean, I think they'll definitely get together at least for a bit. I don't know if they'll get together, but like, what do you think? Because we also see like Essan like, you know, being interested in her and then like her being like, sorry, I've got lab work. And he's like, oh, okay, bye. Do not remember a single time that I've ever seen a scene where a dude goes up in her lap and she sort of talks about like different things. He sort of tries to get her interested in something that she is personally interested in, like a Simon and Garfunkel cover band. And then she's like, no, I don't have any time for that. And then, and then he's like, you're busy. Mm. I'm going to leave. And I was like, I've never seen that, mm. but I just love that so yeah. much because it was like, oh, you can't just fuck off. And you realize that person just has no time for you right now. Yeah. Yeah. Just like decentering yourself a little bit in this person's yeah. life it's like nice. i did love the scene where he goes into his sister's room and is like hey what she's in what is she interested in and she's like she's like if you fuck with her heart i'll i'll fuck with your face i know it's so funny it's just so yeah funny. i also love the fact that camino's yeah. mom has no interest in hiding the fact that she finds him extremely attractive yeah because <laughs> i think also this show like the show looks at that classic sort of like um, romance versus like the you know, like, follow your dreams and your talents and stuff but like not in a kind of bit in like a nuanced way and I think also like it needs a second season to sort of like show the full arc maybe as yeah. well because it kind of it starts off with like you know um, um, Amina like you know she doesn't want to be in the band but she wants a husband and then it's sort of like oh no she wants a husband she wants a band rather than the husband but I don't think I don't think it is like rather than a husband it's just sort of like realizing that like um, she you know she wants to be what did you say like um 
she'll like always be judged no matter what she does so she'll kind of do what she wants to yeah. do um this is a very accomplished yeah. young woman i mean she's pursuing a phd and she is because this is not mm. something that her parents pushing her into at all she wants to be with someone that she loves yeah she has all these lovely fights with her mother where she's like why can't you just let me want this be happily ever after yeah. or something and her mother's like hey can you just maybe pursue what you want to do for yourself first and she's like no i do want this for myself this sort of yeah. duality can very much exist only in women is that ever mm. a conflict yes yes absolutely and it's like and as like a muslim woman as well yeah. she's got kind of all those other added pressures and like other added like ideas about her that she's having to grapple with as well and she's like fuck it like this is the stuff that i want to do and this is like who i am like i just have to like stop being worried about i there are so many ideas about what who i should be um and i've just got to kind of like take control and like just do things my own way you're never going to behave in a way that people are going to approve of you so you might as well do what you want to a degree right this is just a creative outlet that she wants to pursue and she should be able to so she sort of just realizes for herself that that's actually completely fine. I did want to mention like her like storyline after watching it a couple of times reminded me so much of Gilmore Girls. Yeah, please go for it. Because yeah, in yeah. Gilmore Girls, Rory's best friend, Lane Kim, hides music under her floorboards, but also hides it in like this closet that she has. As soon as the closet opens, you have all these twinkly lights, glitter and stuff, and like all these rock mm -hmm. bands. And she's, uh, Lane Kim in the show is so knowledgeable about music in general. And... It's all hidden from her mother, who is a very conservative Christian. And and that's how she gets outed because she doesn't want to she doesn't want to turn that one chance down to perform. And so her mother like finds all of this stuff and then throws her out of the house. But um, because Amina also has this space in her closet where like all this stuff is hidden in a way. But it's not really hidden from like they're very supportive of this like creative outlet that she has. Mm. And I'm sure that Don McLean uh, like fan. Uh, phase started with her father because he talks about how he met him once when, C when Cyrus uh, sleeps over at their house. And I just like the fact mm -hmm. that they did the same thing of this is something that Amina is sort of a little bit ashamed of or is not quite confident mm -hmm. uh, about enough, I guess. It's not about her parents being oppressive. I just like the fact that they didn't use that trope again. But it is sort of in terms mm -hmm. of the visual language, it, it just reminded me so much of Lane Kim. I think you wrote this. It's much more nuanced because it's not quite like she's being oppressed by Muslim parents. No, she just doesn't quite know who she is yet, maybe, and like how much she sort of should allow herself pursue what she wants. Yeah. yeah. And she's, yeah, and like we said, like she's very like aware of like people's ideas of yeah. her. And then eventually she's like, I'm going to be judging about what I do. So I'm just going to do what I yeah. like. You do see Bisma having like a very functional, that sounds so weird, mm. functional marriage, <laughs> functioning marriage, <laughs> happy marriage. Um, the characters all have like very different relationships. And you've got Amina who really wants to get married. You've got Noor who's kind of getting married. You've got Bisma who's in like a very happy marriage. You've got Syra who's like, I don't want this. This is like... <laughs> marriage is not my thing official relationships not my thing and it's, it's so nice. I really like their relationship as well where it's just like okay we're officially unofficial <laughs> it's like hooray it's quite sweet none of these relationships are shown as one note like even like Bisma mm. being like a man that you clearly love and has a child with even that isn't shown as and now they agree on everything and they're just happy all the time this is like a couple that respect each other's opinions yeah. instead of just being this is just a supportive husband he doesn't really he doesn't have a, his own point of view or anything which I also find unbelievably boring they didn't show someone who was just <laughs> happily single yeah I guess Aisha oh no wait um what's the name um Montaz oh good point Interesting. I think they just don't talk about Montaz's relationships at all. She's just there and vibing and smoking, vaping. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I just assumed that the show was going to have a huge conflict around the fact that Amina was going to find out that they used Asan to like lure her into the band. She figured that mm. out pretty quickly and she was. Oh. <laughs> That's also the first time she contributes to songwriting for the band. Instead of making this a very basic conflict. I think like, sorry, I've just had another th thought about Amina. It's like, um, you know, when she's kind of decides to go to the band, it's like not just because she's like, oh, I'm going to give up on marriage, but it's like, you know, like this, like dating app isn't working for me. It's like, cause she goes on that date with like dates on just like creepy and like creepy guys that don't get her. Um, and so it's not like she's giving up on marriage and that like, this isn't something she wants, but it's like, it has to be the right guy. And like, I'm going to do this for me and not like, just try and like, you know, like do the, yeah, like do the band for me, but also do like dating for me. And like, I don't know, like on her terms, make 
yeah on her terms exactly on her terms so it's not kind of yeah not just like giving up part of herself and I think again what we were saying about like you know different like representation of different like Muslim women different relationships it stops it from being a trophy show like I mean it's like a show like written by Nida Van Zor, created by Nida Van Zor. um but it's also like when you have like a show that gives you like lots of different representations it stops it from being all about like the one character that must give you everything or like the one relationship must give you everything and it's like when you get to see like a lot of different people doing lots of different things it just means that yeah it's not like about it's not even just like busting stereotypes it's just like representing people as like multiple because you can't do that when it's just one person yeah. and I'm pretty sure I stole that critique from Rowan Ellis <laughs> like we steal everything from Rowan Ellis apparently I'll, I'll link that in the show notes if I'm like okay yes I definitely stole that um, but yeah, there was just a lot of praisal of headscarves on the show in comparison to how headscarves are presented in Degrassi or yeah. Grey's Anatomy, who, who wear hijabs on the show, like in very different styles, the way that they are tied, the way that mm. the, the colors change, the fabrics that are used and everything. Yeah. And it's also like wearing a hijab is like, or a niqab is like never an issue for the character. Like they never say like, oh, I really wish I wasn't wearing this. Yeah. Like, it's just like, you know, and it's like some, you know, like Syra doesn't wear a hijab, like it's just it's never like an issue for the characters it's only an issue for like the you know the white people in the cab or like in or like the people at the that club that yeah. one time it's like never something that like it's not a conversation that's like that like these people want to have in their own time it's just like no this is my choice and like it's not even it's not even something to discuss because it's just it just is it's just fine so it's like not an issue so they're not talking about it the head coverings are not the issue the issue is like white people's reaction to them <laughs> yeah it's white people's as well yeah food, absolutely yeah, so it sort of showed like different ways of like being angry being depressed and like mm. having different of emotional issues because of kind of like that isha's character was just pissed off most of the time <laughs> because yes. i just love her so <laughs> sorry just the line pitch i don't skip <laughs> Yeah, and it's like these women again. Women are allowed. These women are allowed to be angry without it being kind of like you know, like like angry woman, like or kind of like being dehumanized for their anger. They're just allowed to be angry and allowed to you know, yeah, process emotions in different ways. Like Syra and her like grief, um, and yeah, Aisha and just yeah, <laughs> and her experiences and just I just love the show so much. When I watched it, because the show is what six episodes long. And they're like 25 minutes each the amount of i watch yeah. a lot of television i watch a lot of movies and i've recently been watching a lot of queer movies and stuff but like the amount of shit that gets made the amount of movies that exist are just some old dude who's really struggling with the emotional choice of banging a 20 year old and i'm just like you like how about we take a little bit of that money and we use that for like more shows like this yes yes and like, I remember my dad saying he really enjoyed the first three episodes, but he found the last three like a bit too tropey and sort of predictable. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of the point of this show. It's like a comedy yeah. and it's like got the rom-com tropes. It's sort of no, and it's about, it's like, what did you think was going to happen? Like from the beginning, you kind of know where the show's going to go. But that's not really the point. Like the point is the characters and like the people that you get to meet and like, the, it's the way that they get there you know yeah. it's about the journey not about the destination <laughs> like it is kind of quite you know it has the rom-com tropes it has the like kind of getting into a band kind of tropes but it's sort of like you're getting to kind of see these fleshed out characters and it's like not the point of it isn't that it's like a really original concept in like a sort of like stylistic way I guess it's like allowing these people to it's allowing like Muslim women to be in the in these in these tropes or like in this narrative yeah. to begin with and also kind of like exploring their characters and their lives and kind of the repercussions for them so it's a bit like dad your take is not a very <laughs> interesting take <laughs> like mm. i do understand that a flea bag might seem more interesting to people because it doesn't have this happy ending i wanted amina from the beginning to join the band i think the voiceover tells you that from the beginning it doesn't play with your emotions in a way that some shows it is about her finding herself and that's kind of the beauty of it yeah it's like the, the show isn't like there to sort of like completely like change all these narratives it's like no we're going to use these narratives and use them in an interesting yeah. way which and does. the writing is unbelievably yeah. original yeah and i'm excited to see what they do in the second season like see if they do like subvert it more or just like you know whatever they do i mean hopefully there's yeah if there is a second season which we want please um tunnel four yes also there's a soundtrack yes if if you guys want to listen to yeah. that yeah watch, watch the, the show. show it's fantastic yeah, yeah.
Okay, so yeah, I think we come to come to the end of the episode. Yeah. Okay, we have social media you can follow. I also read the other day that we should also plug our personal social media. I don't know if you want to do that. I don't really uh, care. I don't know. I'm, um, I don't really care. I'm like, I don't really use my personal social medias that much. Or not like, not podcasty stuff. So yeah, I'll, I'll just, I mean, if you want to follow me, I'm LLII underscore Harvey on Instagram and at Harvey 15 on Twitter. I am... Um looking up what I'm called <laughs> <laughs> I am um, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at mx uh, Dora Padfoot yes that is a Harry <laughs> Potter reference um, <laughs> and on Twitter I am also yeah <laughs> the same <laughs> sorry at mx Dora Padfoot and you can follow our podcast at at Liliana pod on both Twitter and Instagram and that's l-i-l-i-a-n-n-a mm-hmm. pod yeah of course yeah. You can also write us an email. Yeah. No, sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, my, my, the way my name is spelled is slightly strange. But it's, you know, kind of easy to remember because it's just the same two letters twice. Kind of like your name. <laughs> I kind of like the fact when I type in your name, I can actually find, I find it relatively easily. Because a lot of my friends just have weird social media. I mean, I guess I do too. <laughs> you could also write us an email, uh, Liliana's pre-read media take at hotmail.com mm-hmm. if you want to yeah let us know what you yeah. think let us know if there's anything you'd like us to cover uh your thoughts yes yeah. or if you want to be on the show if you like you're like i really want to talk about this thing i really want to yeah. talk about like, audience preconceptions of like this particular piece of media or like just talk about like gender and feminism in this piece of media give us a shout we'll very happily have you on the show we've already had our first guest and hopefully we'll have many more in the future that was really fun. I was expecting it to be like really exhausting and stuff, but it was just really great. I mean, probably also because your friend <laughs> is really great at this. It was I just know. really fun and really easy yeah, I in really a way. enjoyed that episode. I really enjoyed recording that one. Uh, <laughs> recommendations. So I got in there quickly because you hadn't yeah. put any recommendations down. I was like, Anna's probably going to want to recommend this as well, but I'm going to do it first. Um, so yeah, I'm going to recommend <laughs> Working for the Knife, the new song just released by Mitski. It will be like about five months later by the time we release this episode. So this will not be a new, yeah. a new song anymore, <laughs> but it's really good. When it dropped, me and Anna were just talking about it. We were like, yes, this like describes me so well. How does she know? <laughs> and I was like... Yes, I am a mere 21, and yeah, I can still relate to this song. It's written from like a 29 year old's perspective. I was like, no, it's so me. Um, but yeah, it's a good song. I recommend it. Um, so I have two recommendations just because I want to. But one is a band called Schoolgirl Bye Bye. But I'm also going to. Oh, okay. Have you got an album you recommend? I'm sorry. I should be more precise. That's no, right. No, no, no. Sorry. No, I. Oh, okay, right. No, no, that's all right. I'm just like on Apple Music adding them now. Um, but I'll just like, I have an essentials playlist. I just bought, get essentials playlists. Such an influencer. I'm influencing you. <laughs> you influenced me. Yes. <laughs> I take your recommendations very seriously. I'll have you know. I do. I'm just going to do yours as well. Yeah. I love whenever you're like, hey, yeah. have you listened to this music? I'm like, I'm going to do now. Um, <laughs> but also, I've been watching a lot of queer movies. There's someone on TikTok who's made a, a lesbian a sapphic list of movies that need to be watched. I watched like two or three in a row that were very depressing. Not bad movies, but just, as you know, if you watch queer movies, it just ends with a lot of death and then mm-hmm. like broken hearts. But there's a movie called The Incredible True Adventure of Two Girls Falling in Love. Mm-hmm. And it's a movie from 1995. It's an American film. And if you want to watch the rom-com, a lovely story of two people falling in love. And I'm not giving anything away because that's what the movie's called. It's really <laughs> lovely. It's really nice. And it's really uplifting. And yeah, if you want to have fun with a movie that is not going to like depress you at all, I happily... And it's only an hour and a half. Sorry, I'm looking nice. at it right now. Oh, there's someone, I'm looking, there's a trailer and someone's on roller skates. I'm having an amazing <laughs> time. I love this film yeah. already. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Yeah, but I can just highly recommend that one because the one I watched before that was good, but boy, that was mm. depressing. Um, it, Which one was that? Uh, the World to Come. Okay. It's with um, the person who played Princess Margaret in The Crown. Oh, okay. Vanessa Kirby. Yeah, I think so. And Catherine Waterston, mm-hmm. who was in the Fantastic Beasts movies as the Newt Scamander's love interest. I don't remember her name. Oh, yeah. Her. Something Goldstein? Yeah. Yeah. But the movie also like features an actor and a producer that has been accused of horrible like sexual misconduct. So I do not know who the fuck thought it was a good idea to let that man anywhere near a story that mm-hmm. is about like marriage and stuff. And I'm like, 
gross. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I did want to watch the movie because it was on the list and I when I'm saying like I'm recommending this one movie I'm not saying the world to come is a bad movie I don't think that's true at all it's a very interesting movie mm. also female directed like it's not from a man's perspective but like one I don't want that dude anywhere near a story that has anything to do with that kind of stuff yeah it was just very depressing and just having watched a lot of queer movies it was just the one I watched before that was a Korean Japanese movie that was like about a couple that like never got to be together and sort of got separated into these mm -hmm. two different countries and like met each no. other again like decades later <laughs> And I was just like, I just want to watch something uplifting and positive. And so I recommend The Incredible True Adventure of Two Girls in Love. That sounds really good. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to watch that now. Um, okay, yeah, it's on my to watch list right at the top. But I am like happy Amazing. to be watching so many queer movies, to be honest. I do enjoy that because, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. And I've, I've been like, one song by Mitski. I've just not been like listening or watching that much stuff recently. I've been re-watching, I've been watching Ted Lasso because everybody was talking about like it and it? I was like, sure. I, see, I, I enjoy it. I kind of feel like, it, I feel like it was overhyped for me a bit because everyone was like, it's the most amazing thing. It's won so many Emmys and like, blah, blah, blah. I also kind of think it's a little bit white saviory, and I'm sort of waiting to see whether it does anything that's surprising with that because I feel like the kind of like, uh, is it like Sam who's like one of the cats who's like from Nigeria and then like the guy who's from like Venezuela, I think. And they just don't really have very fleshed out characters compared to all the white characters. And I'm sort of waiting to see whether they flesh them out a little bit more. I feel like maybe in season two they will, but it's just a little bit like, oh, it's a bit disappointing. It's okay. I know, I quite, I, I like bits of it. I'm like, it's kind of positive and fun. Have you seen it? No, because I don't know like how to feel about it because people are like either like, mm. this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Or like, this is like the uplifting story of our time that everybody needs. Or people have been like, this is shit. And I'm like, I don't know how to watch a show like with that kind of- uh, um, So Polaroid. Polaroid? Polar po polarizing. Polarizing. Yeah, polarizing show. I, I think it's, I don't know, I enjoy it. Like, it's just kind of nice sort of turn your brain off kind of comedy. It's sort of like a bit girl bossy feminist in some place. Like, it's sort of nice because there's like a sort of like female friendship that's quite lovely. But it's also kind of like, they're sort of like, oh, I'm going to hire you. And she's like, oh, I didn't know you could just hire me. And it's like, oh, men hire each other all the time. And it's like, you're two white women. So it's sort of a little, little bit like, mm, um, yeah, it's it's okay. And it's also got, um, what's his name? Uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, the guy, wait. Um, guy for, plays Rupert Giles in Buffy, whose name I should know. Fuck, what's his name? Because he's been in a bunch. Anthony Stewart Head, of course. Anthony Head. Um yeah, sorry, he's also in that, and he also plays a character called um, Rupert, which I was like, that's quite funny, um, because, like, he's also called that in Buffy, and then, like, as a, like, a young <laughs> rapscallion, he was called Ripper, like, his, like, his, like, also, <laughs> back when he was, like, a teenager, people called him Ripper. Jesus. Um, back when he had, because it's weird as well, because, like, when he's younger, he has, like, a sort of, like, a cockney accent and then when you and then when you because it's like when you're a teenager you have a cockney accent and then you grow up to have like an upper middle class accent and that's how it works it's just like very like the people who wrote this show do not know <laughs> it's just very funny um sorry but yeah um i don't know maybe he puts it on i just want to shout that wasn't uh, <laughs> sorry sorry yeah no 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 go 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 no, no, I was just, I was just going, well, that, I just want to not, not to anything. I just want to not mention the name of the Korean film I was talking about. I don't want to like, we just talked about the fact that we're like what, two white people just sort of like reviewing the show and stuff. I didn't want to like not shout out the not, name of the Korean film just because I couldn't remember it. Uh, the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The one that I watched is Moonlit Winter. Moonlit Winter. Yes. Nice. Just wanted to like shout out the name of that. Just so I don't only recommend like the Western films, like by title. Yeah, and like no, the other one is like, oh, I also watched a Korean true. movie. That one's actually kind of lovely in terms of like a mother-daughter relationship. So it's also very interesting, mm. but not as uplifting as the adventures of two girls in love. Um, but um, did you, and I didn't know this, like, did you notice that the lady like in Ted Lasso, see again, I've seen so much like content about Ted Lasso and I've never watched an mm. episode of the show, but like the lady who like um, is like managing the, or, like the, owns uh, the team. Cool team. Yeah, she's, yeah. I mean, the one the thing I did recognize her from is like, she's the mother of Jackson and sex education. Oh, but do you know who else yeah, of she course is? she is. But do you know Wait, who else, else she is? is she? Shame, what? shame, shame. <gasps> oh my God, it's her. Yeah. Of course. It, oh my, because I was like, she looks vaguely familiar, <laughs> but like she probably has one of those faces. 
oh my god like both of those and it's like in sex ed she's quite obvious like it's quite obvious it's her I think she just wears very different clothes and her hair's slightly different I was like this is not the same person yeah oh yeah no of course she's the <laughs> Game of Thrones lady oh my god <laughs> Oh. I just think because she's such a beautiful big smile like on Game of Thrones she has all these drapey like ropey things and, but also like of, obviously because like she's not doing something cheerful yeah. she's not like smiling Ooh. or anything so you just sort of but I like no. I like looked her up Jack. like just like see what else she's been in I was like oh that's the lady from such education that's Jackson's mom like one of Jackson's moms and then it was like Game of Thrones and I was like who was she in Game of Thrones and then I googled <laughs> it and I was like oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh so good oh thank you for telling me that that's gonna just improve my enjoyment of the show 10 but i'm gonna be like yes this is the best show i've ever seen uh this is like a show for our times uh yeah <laughs> can't believe i didn't realize it was jack's one of jackson's mums though yeah anyway yeah i feel like it's yeah sorry would you, you recommend the show to me or would you say like i don't know or like because i generally don't know how i feel about this and i've never seen an episode <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel like i've heard so much about it and i, I feel like it's kind of like kind of nice feel goody kind of television it's, it's yeah it's just sort of fun. i think there are like definitely good parts about it like you see one of the characters like have a panic attack and then they just sort of like talk about it and it's sort of like so you need to feel any shame for this or anything and it's sort of I don't know I feel like you probably won't love it sorry you might <laughs> could be wrong um but it's sort of like there are nice there are very nice elements to it uh do you want to end with a joke or do you want to yeah let's end with a joke I'll I'll give you again this is not a, this is another music joke because I couldn't find very many punk ones let's go let's um, go let's go all right okay so what music do fish listen to the God, what was the band called? Bloaty? Bo no. What? <laughs> Something in the blowfish. No? Okay. What Ooh. what do what do what kind of music do fish listen to? <laughs> Something catchy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I have to look up what that band's called now. Is it who <laughs> Yeah, it's not even like a kind of like a band name that's kind of to do with fish. It's like something catchy. No, it's and I was really like no, it's, this is like the least bad joke it's I could a dad find. joke it's good no the, it the is. band is called hootie and the blowfish i apologize for that band